Voters in our region are looking to cast their vote in the upcoming general election. Northwest Public Broadcasting and the League of Women Voters of Benton and Franklin Counties want you to know the candidates. Recorded at the Washington State University Tri-Cities Campus, this is Vote 2022. Good evening and welcome to this virtual candidate forum. My name is Ravine Jimenez. I am a member of the League of Women Voters of Benton and Franklin Counties. The League is a nonpartisan organization that neither supports nor opposes candidates. In presenting these forums, it is our goal to provide opportunities for voters to become better informed about the people who are running for public office. The 2022 general election candidate forums have been pre-recorded in person by Northwest Public Broadcasting at the WSU Tri-City Studio rather than on Zoom. They will also now be available at nwpb.org vote 2022 through our additional partners, the Columbia Basin Badger Club, the Cities of Richland and Pasco, and of course, the League's website and Facebook page. Please go to lwv bf.org to see the complete information for accessing any and all of these sites through November 8th, 2022. At this time, I would like to introduce our moderator, Matt Loveless from Murrow College of Communication, WSU Pullman. Please welcome Matt. Good evening, everybody. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for the opportunity to do this with you again as we take a look at a number of races on ballots in the Tri-Cities this election season. Northwest Public Broadcasting's Vote 2022 series will include 10 debates with 20 candidates who've agreed to the league's format here. Tonight, we'll stick to three races and the six candidates whose names appear on ballots for Franklin County voters. We will meet our candidates for our first debate in a moment. But first, for our viewers, here's how today's program will work. I mentioned three races. We'll get to the Pasco School Board, Benton Franklin Court Judge, and Franklin County Commissioner 3. With that, here's how timing will work. All candidates will have 90-second opening statements. We'll then follow with a pretty quick back and forth four questions for each race and a 90 second time limit for responses on those. Now, as moderator, I do reserve the right to include more questions or time permitting, allow for some closing statements. For now, those are not part of today's program. But of course, we'll all do our best to stay on time and on top. Tonight's program starts on the Pasco School Board. There are a few contested seats up for election there. Just one of those had two candidates either willing or able to spend time with me today on the WSU Tri-Cities campus, and that's in the District 3 position. Challenger Amanda Brown and incumbent Steve Christensen, thank you so much for being here today. We appreciate your time. And as we get started here, we have just short of 20 minutes together, so we will get right to it. And as I said there in our rules overview, we start with some opening statements. We have set aside a minute 30 for these and for the questions that will follow. And we begin alphabetically by last name, which means Ms. Brown, your first 90 seconds for your opening statement. Thank you so much. My name is Amanda Brown and I'm running for Pasco School Board. I am a fourth grade dual language teacher in Kennewick School District. I have been teaching for seven years and I have a bachelor's degree in elementary education and a master's degree in English language learning education. I also have two students who attend Pasco schools. In my professional career, I have facilitated multiple committees. I am a guided language acquisition model teacher in my school and in the district. And I also chair the KSD dual language curriculum adoption committee which currently is doing the groundbreaking work of selecting a dual language curriculum for our elementary schools. I'm running for school board because I believe that the board needs representation from someone who spends time in schools regularly and understands the diverse population that makes up our Pasco schools. Thank you so much. Ms. Brown, thank you very much. Mr. Christensen, we'll turn this to you. We are 90 second opening statement. Very good, thank you, Matt, for hosting this and thank you to the League of Women Voters for having this forum for us tonight an opportunity to share some of our ideas in education. Um, so I am Steve Christensen. My wife and I have lived in the Tri-Cities for 20 years now, 20 plus years. We moved here in 2001. We have five children, all of them graduates of Pasco High School. So we've got some, uh, we've got some bulldogs in the mix. I ran for school board nine years ago with the uh, with the hope and expectation of improving education and helping education in the Pasco School District. I think education is critical. We have to have good, a good education system to teach our kids, 
they're going to be our future leaders. They are our future. And uh, the key to unlocking their success is found in education. As far as leadership goes, I've been on the board now for nine years. I'm proud of the accomplishments that we've done. I think we're doing some really good things. We've got uh, good things on the, on the books for this year, goals that we want to work on and accomplish. So I think that's, a, that's been a great thing for me and a great thing for the district. As far as leadership goes, I've served uh, in church leadership, and I may talk a little bit more about that later on, but um, also I work as an engineer by day, so that's uh, got some problem-solving skills, I think, that will help us here. All right, Mr. Christensen, thank you very much. Ms. Brown, thank you very much. Let's get to these questions now brought to us by the League of Women Voters of Benton and Franklin Counties. And perhaps you covered this maybe in a way in your statement, but will allow for a more broad view of the state of the school district in your estimation. What do you think is the most urgent issue for the Pasco School District, specifically for this upcoming 2022, I should say we're in the 2022-23 school year. Ms. Brown, go ahead. Thank you. The most pressing issue for the Pasco School District, I believe this year, as we enter and we're in the 22-23 school year, is overcrowding in our high schools. Currently, Chiawana High School is our largest high school in the entire state of Washington in terms of student population. Pasco High School is in the top 10 of largest high schools in terms of student population in the state as well. Um, there are plans to put a bond in February of 2023, and it is of the utmost importance that we educate the public on the, the importance of passing this bond and the importance that it is to provide our students adequate places of learning. Right now, my son is at Pasco High School, and except for his CTE courses, all of his classes are in portables. And I think that we need to provide our students places of learning where they feel included, where they feel important, where they feel valued. And passing the 2023 bond will certainly be a step in the right direction to accomplishing that. All right, Thank, Brown, you. Thank you very much. Mr. Christensen, once again, it's sort of a broad question, but what's the biggest challenge ahead this school year? Well, I, I think uh, I, I have to agree with Amanda that overcrowding is an issue, and that's one of our top priorities as a board this year. We've established that as, a, as, as one of four priorities. My concern, my, my thought is our most important priority is to get our kids back on track in learning from COVID. I know we've been back in school for a while. Uh, we're finally getting back to normal. But we've seen a slip both in our math and our reading education. And so we have made a priority as a district that we want to, or as a board, and instructed our superintendent that we want to focus this year on reading, on our reading education at all grade levels. Uh, make sure that our students are reading where they need to be because reading is going to be the key to all of the rest of their education. So that is one of our top priorities. And then also, as Amanda talked about, we've got the bond coming up. We've, we've got the two largest high school, well, I shouldn't say one largest and one in the top 10, two extremely large high schools that are beyond capacity. So we've got to educate voters on that as well. So those are two of our top priorities this year is to get reading back on track and to get our high schools pass that bond for a third high school. All right, thank you very much. Uh, now, moving on to number two, and this uh, question talks about the topic of banned books, which has certainly been in the headlines a lot lately. According to the American Library Association, the number of books being banned at districts across the country are at an historic high. More than a thousand titles added to a growing list across the country. What is your position on banning books in Pasco School District schools, Mr. Christensen? Well, thank you for that question. So let me just say, first of all, I think there are some books that are not appropriate for, for schools. Um, I understand we want to give people the opportunity to learn what they can, to express themselves, but as, uh, as a school district, I don't think that we need to have those types of books that are objectionable to parents in our libraries. I think uh, we've got to have parent input in our school system. And, Teaching reading, writing, math, science, those things can certainly be done without some of the books that we are, that are being banned. Now, fortunately, in our district, I'm not aware of any books that have been banned. I, I think that's a reflection on our community and on the people who serve us in, in selecting the materials that we have in our libraries. But I am not opposed to removing books that have inappropriate content, especially 
at certain age levels. So I, I fully support those who think that there is materials that need to be removed and removing them. And I guess I, maybe I'll ask this follow-up and I'll include it in when I asked you the question as well. What would be included in that inappropriate content? Well, I think uh, so. Every family has different values, right? Especially when I mean, we've talked about sexual education. Some of those things that talk about that have sexual content, I don't think uh, are appropriate in, in school. I mean, there are things that would be banned in a community, yet we can read them. I, I don't say that in our district, but some schools, um, that's the material that's being banned. So, All right, thank you, Mr. Christensen. Ms. Brown, the same question, like I said, I would ask you the same way. So what's your position on banning books in the Pasco School District? And in fairness, I'll ask, where do you draw the line on what's appropriate for students? It's an excellent question and one that has already been addressed in other school boards in our area. My position on banning books is that all curricula that is currently being taught in schools in Pasco School District has passed through multiple steps to be adopted in the school district curriculum. They go through a curriculum adoption committee that is comprised of teachers and administrators. Uh, those teachers and administrators follow a rubric. Um, I know this because I, as the chair of the Dual Language Adoption Committee in Kennewick School District, we actually developed our own rubric, um, guiding it by the Center for Applied Linguistics rubric, but also putting in what we felt were the things that we really wanted to focus on that our students needed to see in a curriculum, and that is being valued and having authentic materials that the students can see themselves in. That when they attend school, they have a feeling of being able to be themselves and having a place of belonging. And I feel that curricula really is the foundation of where we build that sense of belonging and the sense of knowing who you are in the world by those instructional materials that we have. And so after it goes through the district adoption committee, the curricula goes out to the public and the public has the opportunity to read and to see all of those instructional materials and to give feedback. And that would be the excellent point to bring up those points of where they find it offensive or think it's not appropriate for certain age levels. And so after it goes through those criteria, I believe that if it passes into the school district to be adopted as curriculum for our students, that it has gone through adequate steps for our district to use. All right, Ms. Brown, thank you very much. All right, let's move on to question number three now here. And I believe we're allowed to now say the pandemic is behind us, but that does not mean it wasn't or isn't still having some negative effect on the mental health of our students. So what policies and procedures would you initiate or support for the Pasco School District to help with this problem moving forward? Ms. Brown. Thank you. The pandemic in some ways is behind us. Um, in schools, uh, we still have students who wear masks, um, which continues to be a point of contention among some people. Um, in the school where I work, we have the highest migrant population in, um, in Kennewick among elementary schools. And so we see a lot of students who come to school whose parents are working in the fields and in warehouses and who don't have sick time. And if they happen to get COVID, they're out for two weeks with no pay because those jobs don't generally have benefits. And so in that way, I would say that the pandemic is somewhat behind us, but we're still seeing the residual effects of it. Um, and as far as mental health, uh, what we can do to support our students is make sure that our, stools, our schools have counselors that are available to our students. Um, we saw huge increases in the needs of our students once they didn't have that social interaction with their peers and with teachers and being able to just have that social dynamic in their lives. And so now we understand the importance and we brought that into classrooms. And that's why we're seeing uh, social emotional curriculums being brought into classrooms to make sure that students have that focus and are able to exercise that, uh, that part of their lives as well as learn academics in the classroom. And when the counselors are available, um, it's an excellent opportunity for the students to have that one-on-one -on -one time with someone when they really need to talk. The, the thing, that, um, I believe I've run out of time and I have more to say about that. Um, but I thank you for that question. It was very, a very good question. Yeah, and well, you know, move the question on to Mr. Christensen because you know that the me we're talking about mental health effects of the pandemic, whatever it might be long lasting from the pandemic. How do you handle that now at this point as a board member? So 
as a board member, we set policy. We don't get involved in the in the day-to-day -day operation of the district. Our district currently has contracted with some with a service provider to help those students who feel that need, um, and we've been very successful at that. I think we all acknowledge that there are students who are challenged because they've missed that social interaction. They've missed not only that social interaction, but the learning that happens and how to manage and deal with the challenges of, of life that they face in, in different situations. So uh, as, as a board, we just to make, need to make sure that those opportunities are available to them. And we've done that as a board. We've provided some funding to that. We've used some of our ESSER funds in, in making those services available to our students. So I think we acknowledge that it's critical and, uh, and want to provide those opportunities for our students and those services as they need them. As far as the pandemic goes, I think, uh, I think COVID is gonna be around a long time. Um, but I think as far as the pandemic goes, it, thankfully it is behind us. Our governor is going to end his emergency declaration. I think uh, that it's time for us now to move on to start addressing the education loss, to start addressing the social and emotional needs of our students and as a board just make those make sure that our our district administrators feel empowered to address those things well you both answered that question as if you knew i had a follow-up because uh we will get more time to talk about the pandemic because we talked about the mental health uh, effects of it but let's talk about the learning part of it the progress perhaps lost when it comes to some uh, major subjects i mean we're talking math english other subjects some measurable progress that was lost during the pandemic so what policies and procedures can the pasco school board initiate to help students catch up a little bit mr christensen so i think as we have done as a board is one of our annual objectives this year is to empower our superintendent to go out and find those methods to do that we're not I mean, we're not the educators. So the best thing that we can do is give her the latitude, our superintendent the latitude to go out, do a deep dive, dig into what is missing there, find out what supports we need, and then when that opportunity comes, if we need to provide funding for that, to get our students back up to the level that they can, or at least moving in that direction, the most effective and efficient way that we can. I think that's the best that we can do as a board, is give our give our administrative team the resources, the direction, the supports that they need to be able to go out and make that happen. All right, Mr. Christensen, thank you very much. Same question to you, and this is specifically addressing, I mean, you're entitled to answer it any way you want to, but addressing the, the curriculum uh, deficiencies, I guess, that maybe the pandemic left in its wake. I would say that it isn't so much the curricula that um, it was the cause of our learning gaps that we're now seeing post um, quarantine in the COVID pandemic. Um, but I would have to also agree with Steve that um, the district has annual objectives this year, which address those learning gaps that came out of the pandemic. The first of which is reading acceleration. Um, the district identified and looked at data from last, the last few years and identified that reading was where the students really needed, had the deficiencies and needed to focus. As Mr. Christensen said, reading is how we establish and how we uh, develop and intake uh, knowledge and where we get knowledge to be able to go and become productive citizens in life by by learning and reading and so I would support the district in that initiative secondly their second initiative is the bond which needs to pass so that our students can have um, adequate learning facilities thirdly is um, developing a culture of, of students feeling valued and students feeling a sense of belonging when they go to school, which the research shows among education that when students feel uh, like they belong in schools, like they feel included, they have a deeper knowledge of the things that they learn and they retain that knowledge for longer. And finally, the last initiative of the district this year for their annual objectives was to focus on CTE. And while I'm running out of time, career and technical education is uh, such a great pathway for so many of our students that I don't believe that has been fully explored in all the ways that we can accomplish as a community and working with our community to see what are the avenues that we can explore with career and technical education for those students who don't see a four-year degree or uh, uh, even those that might consider instead of a four-year degree uh, pursuing a future in career in, in, a, in a trade. Well, I'll tell you, we, we, I, I 
we'll say we have a little bit extra time. So I'm wondering if I can have our crew load up a 30 second clock. Let's get some quick closing statements to, to hit on one last point. If you'd like to Miss Brown, if you want to continue, we'll try to stick to that 30 seconds, but I'll give that time to you. I really appreciate this. Mm -hmm. uh, this has been an amazing opportunity and thank you to the League of Women Voters who have uh, given both of us this opportunity to come and speak to the public about why we believe that we are the best choice individually for the Pasco School Board. Again, just to restate, I am an educator. I am in schools on a regular basis. I have a knowledge of diverse student population. Everyone in my classroom is a language learner. And so I have a deep knowledge of the research and the theory that and the pedagogy that goes into diverse student learning. And I am eager to bring that to the board and share my knowledge and bring um, all of the experience that I have in our local schools. And again, I have two students in local schools. And um, again, my time is up. But again, just thank you so much we for this opportunity. We can continue a long conversation. We just don't have the time. Let's hear from you, Mr. Christensen. Again, thank you, Matt. And thank you to the League of Women Voters for sponsoring this tonight. It has been, uh, it's been good. I've served on the Pasco School Board now for nine years. I've learned a lot in that time. I think uh, we have done some really good things from early childhood education, getting our students ready to go to school, um, providing funding for schools. We've got a long-term facilities management plan in place now. We've started some, it's our equity work, but as Amanda referred to, it's the uh, building a culture of belonging in our schools. And so I'm simply asking to send me back to continue the good work that we've done. And thank you for hosting tonight. Well, thank you both very much for your time today. I said it would go quickly, and it has. We really appreciate you coming here to our WSU Tri-Cities campus. Uh, Steve Christensen, Amanda Brown, candidates for the Pasco School Board District 3 position. Thanks for letting us find out a little bit more about you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Our next race now moves to the courts, specifically to a Benton Franklin District Court race. A number of uncontested district court races in the area, but not this one. Joining me now are Carlos Villarreal and Trinity Orozco. Mr. Villarreal, Mr. Orozco, thank you so much for taking the time to come to our studio here in the Tri-Cities. We will have opening statements, a reminder that you have 90 seconds for these. And we start, as we have, alphabetically by last name, which means, Mr. Orozco, your 90 seconds begin now. Thank you. My name is Trinity Orozco and I am running for Franklin County District Court Judge. I thank you for allowing me to visit today and discuss my campaign. I am the best candidate for this position because I have had over 20 years legal experience in our local community. I have practiced as an attorney for 13 years. I am sworn in as Judge Pro Tem in Benton County District Court and I practiced um, as a Rule 9 legal intern and paralegal for nine years prior to that. I have spent the entirety of my practice in district court, although I have worked in other courts. I do feel that district court is the most rewarding and impactful on the lives of others, and I choose to spend my time there. I have practiced in every jurisdiction in our area, including Benton and Franklin County District and Superior Courts, as well as all of the outlining cities. I have represented over 4,000 individuals, have favorably resolved thousands of cases, and have thousands of hours of courtroom experience. My experience with a variety of cases my ability to maintain a large caseload and law office, as well as thousands of courtroom hours, makes me the best candidate for this position. I am the only candidate endorsed by active and retired district and superior court judges, the Franklin County elected sheriff, the Franklin County elected clerk, and all three Franklin County uh, commissioners. Additionally, I'm endorsed and supported by the Pasco Firefighters Union, Teamsters Local 839, and finally, I was recently endorsed or voted as the overall choice for this position by local attorneys in the Benton Franklin Bar poll, uh, receiving 63% of the vote. I am humbly request your support in um, joining me for this next mission in my life and doing Franklin County District Court Judge. All right, Mr. Roscoe, thank you very much. And Carlos Villarreal, your 90 seconds for your opening statement, sir. Thank you. As stated, my name is Carlos Villarreal, and I'm running for Franklin County District Court Judge. I'm the best candidate for this position as I have served as Judge Pro Tem in the City of Pasco and Franklin County for over 13 years, which is longer than my opponent has been practicing law. I'm the only candidate with judicial experience in Franklin County District Court. I have presided over hundreds of pretrial dockets, arraignment dockets, probation dockets, and have conducted both criminal trials and been the finder of fact on numerous small claims dockets. Having raised a family of five, with my wife here in Franklin County for 17 years, and presiding on the regular pro, pro tem docket, it has made me keenly aware of the issues that come before the courts of limited jurisdiction. I have earned the confidence and trust 
of the court administration from both the City of Pasco and Franklin County District Court. I have proven to be a fair, just, and impartial judge. I have spent numerous hours participating in judicial training to ensure that I do my best to strive for equal access to justice for all who find themselves in the courtroom. I am the best qualified and best candidate for this position. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you for those opening statements. Let's move on to our list of questions now provided by the League of Women Voters in Benton and Franklin County. And a bit of an odd start to this, I'll warn you, because I'm not going to ask about you here. I want to start with the civic duty of the people. And I think it's fair to say a lot of people probably see jury duty as a nuisance at best. But what would you like to tell the average citizen about the importance of being willing to serve on a jury? And for this first question, Ms. Orozco, you're up. So I do understand that the general public has negative connotations with serving on a jury, whether it's because they're going to miss work, not able to care for their children, or simply because sitting in court is often boring. Um, in most cases, if a potential juror is unable to serve due to illness or some other issue that's preventing them from attending, um, the court will excuse that juror. However, for people without an actual hardship, I would encourage them of the positive benefits of serving. They do have um, an interesting and often um, entertaining experience learning the law and learning uh, what happens in a courtroom and that it is their civic duty and it's a privilege to serve. Um, I would hope that I wouldn't need to convince their friend or family member to serve as a juror. Um, I do know if I was in trial as a judge, I would make sure the jury was continually informed, that I respected their time, made allowances for things such as cushions or pillows for people who aren't able to sit for long periods of time, um, encourage individuals to bring books to read during breaks, and to make sure that the cases are moving along to avoid the appearance that um, we're wasting the juror's time because that's the last thing we want to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roscoe. Mr. Virel, same for you, because I think a lot of us can probably picture that moment. You get the summons, that little card in the mail. How do we f reframe it for people to make them go, hey, look, look what I get to do instead of look what I have to do? You know, having presided over our trials in district court, I, I know that when we begin the jury process, a lot of people have this, this notion that it's, it's going to be days and weeks. Uh, the reality with, with district court is most trials are done within a day or two. And, and helping them understand that, the, that we have a responsibility and that the greatest legal system in the world that we get to take part in to, to make those decisions of, of, of guilt and not guilt. Um, so I, I think it comes down to education and reminding them that it's, it's not dreaded. It's a great opportunity for us to, to give back to our community. All right, thank you very much. Now let's move on to question number two, and we'll start talking about um, some of the trends here in the area. And as we look at the data, violent crimes have kind of been on a consistent upward trend in the counties here since 2015. So with that context, Mr. Villarreal, uh, what do you think might be the root causes for the number of violent offenders in your area and in the nation in the recent years? And what changes can be made within the court system to help stop that? So I have a unique perspective having been a pro tem in Franklin County District Court and in Pasco Municipal, and there are different root causes. Uh, City of Pasco, a lot of it is, is tended towards um, trespass charges, which is not really the root cause, it's, it's usually homelessness. Uh, people that are struggling, that are, that are trying, trying to get their, their feet on the ground. In, in Franklin County District Court, it's, it tends to be substance abuse. Uh, so it, it really depends on um, where, what jurisdiction you're looking at. Um, and, and it's not something that we can definitively put our finger on in, in, in a minute and a half, but um, regardless, I think what would help is education. We need to connect people with resources, educate them where the resources are, and to, to, to get them out of the court system. Thank you very much, Mr. Villarreal. Ms. Roscoe, same to you, because as, as we look at that trend from 2015 on, that's seven years of some consistent upward movement. What do you think the root causes of that are? Well, I do agree that I believe that the root cause is a substance abuse and mental illness. I do believe that they go hand in hand. Uh, a lot of individuals who are using substances end up having mental illness, which causes issues in our criminal justice system. I think regardless of the crime, if it is um, a barrier to um, access to services, if we're not able to provide resources to individuals, they tend to use drugs and um, commit crime. I think that the solution here is that we're going to need to have some sort of resources available to people, including things like therapeutic courts, um, the recovery center, and um, options in custody so that people can become clean, have their mental illnesses addressed, and move forward. Those are definitely what is causing the majority of the crimes, and I think until we address those, we're not going to have a solution. 
Thank you very much. All right, moving on to question three, and we're delving right into the topic of free speech here. Um, not necessarily the I can say what I want on social media without consequences type of free speech, but truly that separation of what's legally protected and which may incite a hate crime. That may be something you have to deal with here. So for you, what are some of the issues in balancing that free speech against the need to control what you might consider offensive activity? Ms. Uh, Ms. Orozco, you're first. Well, and I, I do feel that we have to follow the Constitution. Certain speech is protected and certain speech is not. Speeches such as hate speech or speech that is going to incite violence or um, be threatening to others is not acceptable. So I don't think that there's um, a line that we can really draw other than to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Free speech is definitely protected, and I would um, ensure that that is protected under the Constitution. I think a judge's a job is to make sure that the Constitution is followed, not to be a judicial activist and decide what they think is appropriate, but to simply follow the rules as written. The rules are there for a reason, the laws are there for a reason, and um, our our society has elected people to draft those, and it's our job to follow those rules. All right. Thanks, Mr. Roscoe. Mr. Virorell, same question to you. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with everything Trinity said. Um, it's, not a, it's not a judge's place to, to legislate from the bench. And there, there is speech that is distasteful and it's hurtful, um, but so long as it doesn't provoke or incite violence, um, and again, that's going to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis, um, it's, it's one of those incredible rights that we have. And, and sometimes Sometimes we don't have to exercise all of our rights, but if you want to exercise that right, there's a place and a time for it. All right, thank you very much. All right, let's move on to our fourth question. Um, and we'll probably have some time for some closing statements here. We'll reset the clock for a short time. We want to hear more from you as well. Um, what do we think that the causes are of high rates of minority incarceration here? And what's one possible preventative measure that you would recommend, Mr. Villarreal? So again, having the, the experience that I have here in Franklin County and in Pasco Municipal, um, typically I, I see a higher rate of incarceration among minority because number one, the crimes that are being committed typically uh, are crimes that they just don't understand. They, they're in our, they come into the country, they don't understand what the rules are. Um, many of them are just driving offenses. They are, they're driving without licenses. They, um, and it's, it's, it's a remedy that can be um, quickly addressed. Um, also, I, I think part of it is, is we're not getting to them, we're not educating them when they're young. Uh, many, many of these young um, minorities, they go around uh, making decisions that they really can't appreciate. And I think uh, because of the language and language barrier in schools and, and, and whatnot, and we're trying to address that, um, they just tend to catch the eye of law enforcement a little bit more. Um, so I think education is, is the key here. All right, Mr. Virel, thank you very much. Mr. Roscoe, same question to you. As, as you sit in your position in particular, watching minority incarceration rates, what do you think the root causes of that are? Well, again, I think that there is definitely an issue with education, as Carlos stated, um, but there is also an issue with substance abuse and mental illness. I think that gangs, obviously gang violence and um, access to drugs is really causing individuals to be incarcerated. Um, recently in the Supreme Court changed the laws regarding drugs and I think that those are going to be now heard in, in district court which is going to give us the opportunity to maybe um, assist those. I think in addition to the fact that they are in custody we have um, to look at resources and access to different resources and alternatives to incarceration. Um, it's unfortunate here that in, um, in Franklin County specifically, uh, we don't have a work release program. Our options and alternatives to incarceration, such as Scramex or home monitoring, are expensive. Um, we do have work crew, but that is provided on specific days. And so instead of allowing people to have that ability to serve their time on home monitoring or Scramex, we're here um, requiring them to serve time in jail because they just don't have the funds to pay for that. So I think that does probably contribute to the number of minorities we have in custody. So it definitely is related to um, their barriers to um, access to resources, to barriers of homelessness, and to um, and drug use, really. Thank you very much, Ms. Roscoe. And now before we go, like I said, we, we do have a little bit more time, so I think we'll just reset the clock to a minute 30. And I don't want to ask a specific question. I just want to give you a chance to have some closing comments. It's a short debate, um, but we want to hear uh, whatever you have else to add here.
Well, I do have the plan of adding therapeutic courts, including Veterans Court and Mental Health Court, to Franklin County District Court. We would also like to add a, a district court drug court because, as I said, crime is going to be, or drug charges will be heard primarily in district courts. Um, I have had contact with a number of counties and have researched the programs and discovered grants available for those, and I think we can get the ball rolling and hopefully have courts um, started by 2023. Within the next year, I think it is a possibility. Um, I, as I said, I'm, I'm thankful you've allowed me to be here today to introduce myself, to give you some information. I'm hopeful that I can help the county, hopeful that I can instill these courts, and um, hopefully put us in the right direction. All right, Trinity Roscoe, thank you very much. Mr. Villarreal, your closing statement. Yeah, so I, I feel that as, as I've served uh, the residents here of Franklin County over the last uh, 13 years, um, I, I've seen the county grow. And there's been, with that growth, there's always this underbelly of, of more, more people finding themselves in the court system. Um, I too have also um, been in discussion and talking with the city of Pasco because uh, the Franklin County, again, Franklin County and, and city of Pasco, they almost see like two different types of cases, it seems like. And it, it, would, it would be really beneficial to maybe team up and have therapeutic courts or, or resources available. I know in the city of Pasco, they put in for a grant to have a community resource coordinator to help pair individuals who might be struggling that can't pay for uh, treatment or don't know where to get treatment uh, to, to get that um, and, and help point people to get the help that they do need. Um, the answer for every, every case is not jail. Um, sometimes jail is, is an alternative and, and it's unfortunate that Franklin County doesn't have the, the resources at this point to, to have work release to have other options to, to avoid putting people in, in, in incarceration, put them in custody. Um, and I, I know that with my experience and the confidence of, of both court administrations, that um, that's something that's easily doable. That's easily doable. And, and again, thank you for your time. And thank you both, Carlos Villarreal, Trinity Orozco, candidates for district court judge here in Benton and Franklin County. We appreciate your time here today. And that brings us finally to our last race tonight, and that's for Franklin County Commissioner 2. Board Chairman Clint Didier is here facing a challenge this election season in the form of former Franklin County Commissioner Rick Miller, a rare race in which both candidates here have experience in the position they're seeking. So we start with opening statements here, 90 seconds for each of you. We'll begin alphabetically with the man closest to me here, Mr. Didier. 90 seconds are yours. Thank you very much. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for this opportunity. And it is position three that we're running for. Okay, thank it, you for that correction. It's position yeah. three. Born and raised in Franklin County, uh, got the opportunity to play a little NFL football, came back farming, and uh, I seen what was going on at our local, local courthouse and didn't like what I seen <clears throat> with the needle giveaway, so, and our road was closed without justification, so decided I was going to make, try to make a difference for our local community and I ran for commissioner and I won and since then we got rid of the needle giveaway. Uh, it was being handed out right next to the 4-H'ers and one of our founding fathers, Ben Franklin, said, I hope there's good sense and virtue enough left to recover the right path. And when you hand out drug paraphernalia next to kids that are going to get their forms at 4-H, that's not good sense. I also in my term, my first four years, which I've been able to achieve there, the, the, the other things I've achieved is I've got night meetings for people who work that would like to attend the meetings. I've got uh, YouTube accessible so they can watch it for home and that was done before COVID. Uh, when I took over as chairman, or chairman there was a f roughly 500, 600,000 in our emergency fund. It is now, as chairman, I got it up to 2.1. Um, other things that I've done is uh, transparency in government I've talked about, defeated the redistricting lawsuit. We got sued because they said we were racist. Uh, of course, we're not. My son-in-law is a Haladio Castillo. Some of my friends and neighbors, and we're the melting pot of the world. We're not a racist community or a society. Uh, beat, defeated the redistricting lawsuit, have, have not voted to raise property taxes since I've been there. And since I've been there, we've 
got our emergency fund, like I said, up to 2.1 million. We haven't raised taxes and we've given everybody the increases in pay that they've asked for. All that without raising taxes and increasing the emergency fund. So in my next four years, uh, I'd like to address the roads and we have taken the road shift money from 1.7 million down to 750,000. And after this year, hopefully we wipe it completely off, shifting the road road shift money. And I see stop, so I will stop. I was just about to stop you. And we're gonna to get to a lot of topics here. So hopefully we get to cover some of those as well. Uh, Mr. Miller, I want you to have your opening statements. Okay, thank you. First, thank you to the League of Women Voters and to the uh, Northwest Public Broadcasting and also for WSU for hosting this event. My name is Rick Miller. Many voters uh, remember me that I previously was Franklin County Commissioner for 12 years. I'm running again. My family and I were enjoying the private life. But we've seen what's happening in Franklin County. The expensive lawsuit. I disagree, it was not a victory. It was expensive lawsuit. The frequent resonations we have in our county, the toxic environment in the hostile behavior. I hope we have plenty of time to discuss some of the important policy issues that impact the citizens of Franklin County. But the election is more basic than that. We are failing in fundamentals. My opponent and I are both Republicans, and I am sure we agree on lots of things. But we differ, what we differ in is, is basics. How to treat employees, how to treat other elected officials, respect for the law, and proper stewardship of taxpayers' money. We have a crisis in Franklin County, and that's why I'm writing. Mr. Miller, thank you very much. All right, let's move on to our questions now, written and gathered by our League of Women Voters of Benton and Franklin Counties. And the first looks into an effort by the Benton Franklin Recovery Coalition. That's been working for years on a recovery center. Mr. Didier, we'll start with you with these questions as we alternate here. Do you agree with that effort, and why or why not? I do agree with that effort, and that's why we all unanimously, the three commissioners and the three from Benton County, agreed for a 0.01% sales tax. Now, my thought was that we put this all over there at Trios, the old, not Trios, excuse me, the old Kennewick General Hospital. That campus is there. It would be perfect for uh, everything that we need uh, for the people that are needing attention for drug abuse, uh, the uh, people that need to be uh, like Mirror Ministries, girls, uh, there's so many different buildings, you could use it for a major lockdown, minor lockdown, and open free to move. With that campus right next to the Kennewick Police Department, it'd be a great campus for keeping safe, and all of your, the people that need to come there, your therapists, all the, the doctors, it's one campus. Everybody comes there one place and gets what they need. And I think that is the, the perfect position for that mental health facility. Now we just lost one of our board members, Trevor Hummer, Hummel. And uh, it's, it's a sad day when we don't have this facility and he was instrumental, instrumental in us getting rid of those needles that the previous commissioners voted to hand out next to the 4-H kids. But he was instrumental in getting rid of that and I thank him for that. But he is now with our Heavenly Father. And I uh, thank Trevor and his family for that. Mr. Deere, thank you very much. And Mr. Miller, I want to turn that question to you as well. Do you support the recovery center efforts? I do, but at first I want to state the needle exchange program is not how it appears. We did not, the commissioners did not approve that. The Board of Health is running the building. They asked if they could do it. We gave them the blessing with a six month pro pilot program. That pilot program, whether he was in there or anybody else, would not have happened. It would not have gone any further. And there was fun, we found out there was some things going on with it. If I would have been in there, it would have been stopped. It was just a six month pilot program. And, uh, but I do believe in, in, in the uh, building there. Uh, I, I believe we need to uh, have mental illness and recovery for these people. I believe we need to take this off of the police's hands, the emergency medical technician's hands, all these people that are in services. We need to deliver these people, take these people to the, a place where they can be served properly, not a emergency room, not a, uh, uh, a jail uh, because they get right back out and they end up in the same place. 
They need to be rehabilitated somewhere and our police need to take them somewhere for less expense on, um, to the community. And also they're just right back out there if not. So I do agree with that. I do, I, I do know, and I've worked with this group with Benton Franklin communities before on both different uh, projects like this and human resources. I was one who started this type of model. It will work if we purchase beds from, Franklin County purchased bed from Benton County and we deliver those people there and it, and it will save a lot of money for our uh, emergency technicians and police and hospitals. All right, thank you very much, mm -hmm. Mr. Miller. Let's move to our second question now, and we'll begin with you, sir. Um, and perhaps the most consistent topic in the area for decades is that Hanford cleanup. And Mr. Miller, I would ask you, what should the long range plans be for the local economy when that cleanup is finished or as the funding for that cleanup begins to be reduced? When it begins to reduce, we're gonna be in a little bit of a, a spot where if there's not as much employees out here, who's going to service the town? Well, it's going to snow. It's going to snowball, is what it appears is happening. As we get bigger, larger, we're going to need more housing. We're going to be, need more transportation. And as these people come here, we will snowball with other businesses. For instance, Dairy Gold coming to town. This is going to increase the housing, transportation. We are going to have to be fit for that. So I believe that um, when and if it ever does go down, uh, uh, you know, uh, less people work here and, and, and the funding stops, which I think is, is, isn't quite a few years yet. Tri-Cities have got to be built up to be sufficient, is, is to be able to make the impact without Hanford uh, in, uh, labor out there. The workforce out there needs to find another job in town if, they're, if it's reduced. Mr. Miller, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mr. Judy, I'll turn that to you as well. It is very much a long range idea, but we want to know where you stand on how the economy adjusts. Well, and, and it is out there a ways, 2.3 billion every year. And that's a lot of money. Now, I've talked to a lot of people that have worked out there and I think that it could probably be cleaned up faster than that if they let the people truly work out there and get it done. We shouldn't be relying on federal money. We're in a mess right now as a country because of the spending of the federal government. If we're gonna be, like Benjamin Franklin said, I hope there's good sense and virtue. If we're gonna be a virtuous society, we've all gotta be willing to take less from the government and do more for our fellow man. And I, with that, we take, quit taking when we don't need to. And just for one instance here, there's a, uh, our insurance program there with Franklin County. We have over 60 people that don't take the insurance, but yet either get it in a VEBA account or in salary. And is that virtuous? It's like farmers not farming. And what we gotta do is we gotta quit doing that to save this great republic for our posterity. But getting back to Hanford, we need to start looking and they're looking at smaller reactors, creating energy, it's a reservation, it's a federal lands, we need to use that and maybe create energy with smaller reactors, more efficient, uh, look at uh, some things like medical isotopes, FFTF, still could be resurrected. Medical isotopes for prostate and breast cancer could be huge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Didier. All right, let's move on to question number three. And for this one, we're going to look into the issue of homelessness. Washington State certainly a disproportionately high number of homeless, and I know that's on the radar of leadership in the Tri-Cities. But question hones, hones in on partnerships that may exist to help address it. So Mr. Didier, this question goes to you. What can the county do in conjunction with the cities in the county to help with the homelessness situation here? Well, I've got a group coming out of California that wants to meet with me and they want to be looking at uh, more affordable housing. And I'm supposed to be meeting with them later this month. They're coming up here looking at areas where they can build this affordable housing. Uh, with the price of everything right now in America, how are you going to be able to create affordable housing? with the price of lumber, with the price of labor, everything is up. Price of fuel, everything is up. It's almost uh, an oxymoron to say affordable housing when the prices of everything has increased so dramatically. But there are other avenues to look, and that is the, the donut hole. We need to incorporate that into the city and get that donut hole where people can build houses down there. We have this Growth Management Act that I'm totally against. And I have been working, trying to get somebody to join me in getting rid of this. Now we're hearing our legislatures talking about this Growth Management Act. It tells us where we can grow, how we can grow, and if we can grow. Bureaucrats over in 
the <laughs> Seattle Tacoma area are telling us what we can do in our own backyard. That needs to be the local decision of the local elected officials. All right, Mr. Deere, thank you very much. Mr. Miller, I'll turn that question to you, and I can repose it for you here. Um, the partnerships to tackle homelessness, what, what can the county do with the cities here? Um, we need to work together. The counties and cities need to work together in homelessness, and I'll tell you why. And if homelessness is a situation where as we grow, and if there's not the housing there, they're, gonna, they're going to be on the streets. And we do not want that. We want people to, uh, we want people to not spread diseases because they're not being taken care of or, or feeding them because they're not getting fed. Or, and what it does is create more problems with our law enforcement. A lot of uh, uh, theft because of that. So I think we need to just kind of collaborate with the city and with the Tri-Cities and work on getting some affordable housing. Mr. Didier is correct. Affordable housing may not be cheap, but in the ratio of what we should make, it should be relative. I hope it is, and, and when I say that, what I mean is that um, as we, as Dairy Gold, other places come in, other businesses come in, as we grow, they should be able to pay feasible work for people, and we can have, actually have uh, enough money to have those homes, and they can afford them. Right now, houses are too expensive, and a lot of young people aren't going to be able to get into them as interest rate goes up. Is that going to create homelessness? Well, I'm thinking more in homelessness is the people that don't have jobs, that the people are out there that's not working. And I believe those people are going to have to have some assistance or we're going to have a lot of robberies and a lot of problems in this county. And it even goes out to the county, Mesa. Just got, they're in the news lately uh, for some things like this. So we just need to get things um, um, adjusted so that we can have a, as we grow, we need to adjust to that. Um, growth and maybe change would be my transition into this next question because uh, lines were recently redrawn and just anecdotally I've talked to people who are like, oh, I'm voting for this person now as things sort of change. I wonder, I want to get your thoughts on uh, the redistricting here in the area uh, and maybe more specifically as the league asks, one pro and one con when it came to redrawing those lines. Okay, and you're talking about county uh, county uh, legislation in state, or what, what are you talking about at all? Yeah, the okay. state legislature. Yeah. Okay, so state legislature, we need to, um, by population, it needs to be adjusted at times. And I think that that just, uh, the census is taken, you need to adjust those populations so there isn't lopsided uh, ca uh, counties or, 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 or districts. And uh, I, think, I think it's a necessary thing to go through legislation. Now, how to do it is a different thing. We have to do that properly with the right committees and the right people. Because if you, as you know, we kind of had some problems with the legislation on, on serving that in those districts. Um, I think the district way is correct. I think we need to have these districts and legislative districts for elections. And at that point, um, as growth, we're going to have changes every four or five years. All right, Mr. Reynolds, thank you very much. Mr. Didier, a pro and a con of the redistricting. Well, the redistricting was uh, forefront for Franklin County because uh, they were really dramatically trying to change the way our maps were drawn. And we actually went through a, draw, a lawsuit. Uh, UCLA came up here, sued us for being racist. So we, we are at the forefront of this whole redistricting. Um, and it was, tried to get, it was tried to be handed right to them in summary judgment until the other commissioner, Mullen, and I said, no, well, we, di we didn't agree to this. And they tried to hide behind executive session to say that it did. No, it didn't. And so we prevailed because our demographer cited that the map, the original map that we are still adhering to with just some minute precincts being moved to get our numbers equal, and we prevailed. Now, uh, yes, we had to pay $375,000 for attorney's fees, and I didn't even want to pay that. I said, why? We won. We won the lawsuit. Well, you got to pay their attorney's fees. And I said, and then the other thing that changed, we have district only primary and general. So now a commissioner will serve the whole county, but only elected by his district. You tell me he's going to listen to the other two districts, the people that live there, when he only represents the one that's going to elect him. It's actually alienating. That's the con. It's alienating the people not to be heard by all three commissioners. And that is bad news. As far as our state, uh, now I vote for Kathy McMorris Rogers. And I still live in Franklin County where the Pasco is in the fourth still. 
Well, gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for your responses. I said this would go quickly, and so we have run out of time today, but we really, really appreciate you being here on our WSU Tri-Cities campus and letting our voters get to know a little bit more about you. No closing comments? No closing statements today. We, sorry, we ran out of time here. Um, but candidates for a familiar seat here on the Franklin County Commission. And on behalf of the League of Women Voters, we want to thank everybody for watching. As a reminder, the 2022 general election is on Tuesday, November 8th. The 18-day voting period for mail-in ballots begins Friday, October 21st. If you still need to register, you can do it online up until October 31st. But you can register in person all the way up to Election Day. NWPB's Vote 2022 coverage continues through Thursday this week. We'll wrap up with a couple of key Benton County races, a commissioner there, as well as the county's prosecuting attorney for our live viewers. We'll carry that here Thursday night beginning at 7. But like all of our programs, we will have them available online. So if you missed coverage of the contested races in the 8th or the 16th districts in Washington, you can find it, including this program, at nwpb.org vote 2022. We'll also be sure to have the rest of our series up there as well. Thank you for joining us tonight. Have a good one.